reminder, so we need the challenge, the problem. How do students get to see the other point of view? Must they know the point of view uh, other than their own exist? How do they go about finding out more? Then the light bulb, they come up with an idea how to address some of the problems. Then they actually make something um, that is supposed to solve the problem, and then you evaluate and improve. And any of those elements can be kind of, you can take a shortcut by providing data that already exists or providing surveys or actually showing prototype of something that exists. And we thought that perhaps it would take some time to um, let you um, brainstorm a little bit, so apply the process um, in practice. And if um, on the other side, if you could just make, I don't know, working groups? Yeah, well, two or three people. you can work in groups, you can work alone, but the idea is that Take a look at this and say, you know, think about your own field or discipline and ask yourselves, are there things, and I, I you know that there are, are there things that will work for this design practice? What do I do in my courses right now, or in the people who I help, um, that aren't just busy work? And is there some way to have them reflect on more and, and, and create create something, which I my favorite part is that that experimentation and some in some um, vernacular, it's called prototyping, but it's like you make something tangible and you just deal with it. The guy who created the, uh, what was it called, not the handspring, Paul Pilot, for days, months before he started, he created anything big, he just put a block of wood in his pocket and he's like, is this the right form factor? He'd walk around with this board in his hand just to see if it was, you know, practical rather than create something and then find out, like, no, oh, I can't deal with this. So that kind of, even if it doesn't work, that the idea of prototyping is important and to be able to envision that prototype part. So are there are there elements in your classes and, and the things that you deal with in action in your life um, where you can get your learners to look at other people's perspectives, even if you're helping another instructor, how can the instructors think about the student's perspective or other instructors and then, then go through that process. And I think there's some disciplines that are <coughs> more difficult than others. Some disciplines just lend themselves well to making things. Uh, if you're in engineering, that's going to be a natural process for you. Uh, if, uh, like me, you spend a couple of decades of your life teaching uh, courses in Spanish literature and film, it might oh. be a challenge um, <laughs> to make something tangible, but possible when they're done that. So even if you teach a lit course or social sciences, no excuse, you can come up with something. So uh, brainstorm and come up with some idea. I actually wanted to use this for policy development. Um, and it is not a not a tool, but it, to, if you create a policy, how will you know it works, what's the potential follow-up, it's sort of the impact assessment at the end, and, and what issues we can do. So we're gonna give you some five to seven minutes to dig in on your own in groups and, and, and come up with some things. And then we're gonna try to pull you back and, and have you share ideas. So. If, if you could, that'd be fantastic because that's the part that's going to be the most fun is when you start hearing other people's ideas about how to apply this. All right. About eight minutes left, and I thought well, like we should time. talk about this a little bit yeah. and get some ideas across. So, any anything pop up in, in your brains about this? I heard, yes, something yeah, did pop up in the brain back there. <laughs> That's all right. Any, um, any ideas? <clears throat> we have instructional design, we have language learners. What else is going on? I always tell my students, be proud and loud. <laughs> <laughs> Are there barriers? <laughs> so I made this supposition that, oh, this would apply to everything. Students or instructors. 
So you guys have something to say about that, having just moved over to the art of teaching classroom. Well, someone who's been his dad. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, students really, there's a great comfort in coming in and being lectured too. Um, you can guess what the professor <coughs> is ask at an exam, what they prioritize, how they, I mean, you learn a lot, right? If you're a smart student, you scope out the professor as much as you learn the material. So when they come in and do active things, they don't get to hear me lecture at them. Um, I do, I do default probably more than a lot of our professors to 20 minutes of lecture and an activity, um, just because I understand their discomfort with that. But um, there's pushback whenever you have change. I mean, there just is. And, and so I'm pretty transparent about, we're trying this out. Here's what I want you to get out of. They feel much safer when they have parameters. Mm -hmm. So here's still the objectives for the day. This is what you'll have to know for the exam, because I do still give exams. Um, now, we're going to play. We're going to apply this. And that seems to help a little. I think that, paper. That, that that attitude has worked for me with trying to think with some, both students and with instructors is, hey, let's figure this out together. It's kind of like, we're going to test this, OK? Can you eat my guinea pig, and let's try it out. And I think this is sort of what happened with the design thinking in your classroom with you two, and then, you know, watching from a distance. It's like, you're like, hey, there's this thing. And you're like, OK, I'll try it out with you. And then it becomes this co-conspiratorial sort of um, quest or whatever to, to try to solve this. And that changes the attitude rather than, you must do this, or you should do this, or bad bad patient, yeah. bad bad instructor, bad student that we're not doing this. Um, and, and that idea of playfulness, learning should be playful. Not always fun, you know, but playful. Always you have to give people, no matter what field, you have to give people a window to grow out of, you know, in the minute you back somebody in a corner, you must do this. Yeah. We all come out swinging, right? Yeah. That's just what we do. So, you know, to, to understand where the stakes are. So we're going to play at this, and there is no consequence if it doesn't work, which George is great about as, as our academic technology person. You know, I would hate to fall on my face in front of George, but he makes it very safe to, um, to let's try this. And so I do the same thing for students. Here's what you have to know for the exam. Now we're going to play. And I give them all or nothing points for showing up as long as they're engaged, as long as I can see them. You know, if they're surfing on Facebook or buying shoes on Amazon, then no. <laughs> so I have to circle the room and keep an eye on. But as long as they're in discussion, there is no right or wrong. And it's the same thing when I go, you know, be proud and loud. I'm like, there aren't wrong answers. Like, we might talk about them. We might push back, and that's OK, because that's part of being a professional. Um, as a nurse, you have to be able to speak about where patients get hurt. And so I explain that to them, too. Like, you know, you might be wrong. Someday you might say, wait, I'm not sure that's the right thing. And the doctor would say, yes, it's exactly the right thing. But I'd rather have you feel safe enough to say it than not. Any other ideas? I just want to oh, yeah. say that if, if you're looking at this and thinking this is complex, this is, you know, after a little bit of active learning before then. It was not lecture, lecture, lecture. Oh, two-day activity on design thinking. <laughs> they are in the active learning classroom. But you can take smaller steps. This is really a complex activity. You could take any of those chunks and use it as its own activity. So for example, having two articles, point counterpoint, or one view, the other view, and the jigsaw puzzle when they have to get together and fill in the other person and then produce a report. You could do just this if they don't do any active learning that's moved in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, you could say, um, I have the research data. Um, I will share with you. Could you anticipate what the outcomes will be? That's another activity that could stand on its own. So we took those activities that you normally do and kind of put them together in a nicer, bigger, more complex two-class activity. But you could use one of these chunks um, as a standalone thing, and then it's, it's much simpler and faster. And perhaps that's the right first step if you, you don't want to jump from lecture to <laughs> active learning, maybe one thing at a time. You could talk them through the whole process and then you know, hit just totally the evaluation and then say, here's somebody's solution. Here's what they did. How do you think this turned out? And what would be the measures that matter to you about whether it worked or not? This is one of the things I really appreciate about your, your first chart here is that you gave specific examples of the different activities and how they worked with these different pieces. And you're right, anyone could stand alone. And that might be the easiest way to sort of comprehend or start to design 
one of these four complex two-day things is just, well, what am I already doing? And what if I just rearrange what I'm already doing into this framework instead of starting from scratch and being like, well, what would work in this framework? Margaret. I also love the, just the really practical use of the research, that's the published research, you know, because you, like you were saying, you had them anticipate and then you're like, here's somebody else's results, compare yours, right? Which gives the students a sense of like, our stuff has value, we can, and this is what we should always be doing, is comparing our practice to research that's been published and see what we can learn from that. And so I think that, that in itself, I was like, that, I love that idea. Of, um, of helping them see the purpose of the research that's published and what do we do with it as practitioners? So, uh, this I approach this from my own academic background. That's history, and often in history, just think we're just pumping information. It's like, you know, what happened in 1066, 1588, 1773, <laughs> and like it's just information. Really, though, there's a lot more that you can get on Wikipedia with about 98% accuracy, right? Um, really what we're there to do is teach them skills and how to approach things. And this is what is really, really good with skills because you can use this to look at historical controversies and not just say, okay, people used to think the world was flat. Well, let's look into this and dive into the problem of why did they think it was this? And maybe not even think of it as a problem, but think of it as why do people think the world is round? And why is it, what information <laughs> are they using? And what information are the flat earthers using? They aren't idiots, they're very educated individuals. Why is this, this debate going on? It's to dive in to the, the, the process of understanding that culture and time and space. And also, I think as well, looking not just at historical controversies, like the Earth is flat, <coughs> uh, but also driving home uh, points of the histor of, of like historiography as well. Why, is, um, why do some people really believe that uh, the colonial relationship between colonial administrators, um, the, the power relationship between like colonial administrators and those um, and, and colonialists. Uh, what what are the what's the the pros and cons of Foucaultian uh, colonial discourse theory versus dialogue theory? What's going on here? And so it's really <laughs> thinking of the historiography, just teaching them skills of debate and research and understanding, and also of being able to place yourself place uh, your your understanding outside of yourself. It's like that. This is teaching those skills. In, in much more robust way of interactive and much lower stakes, so you're not so worried about getting a bad grade, and, and it does it without doing like a research paper, which a research paper is trying to say, you have to learn historiography and research and putting yourself in a different spot. Like really, research paper is like, what's the, the big thing on the front of it? It has to be five pages long, and that's yeah. all they're focused on. I know. So <laughs> that's, that's, I think, is such a powerful tool for that, that type of learning. And, and so, no. I think, thank you for that.